Well, hello there, folks. Welcome to another Somatic Self-Compassion podcast. Lovely to be here with you all. I hope you're enjoying the holiday season, whatever it is that you do at this time of the year. So today I wanted to talk um, specifically about how to address isolation or loneliness or difficult emotions we might have when we're in, when we're in isolation <laughs> or when we're in quarantine because of coronavirus. Um, I am at the moment in quarantine. I um, traveled from the United States to Australia and there is mandated hotel quarantine in this country for 14 days. So I'll be in this hotel room for 14 days. Um, I can't leave the room and no one can, can come in to the room. So this is sort of what quarantine is. This is sort of a definition of, of isolation. Um, I can look out the window though. I can see the traffic and the people going past, which is sort of fascinating. Um, I'm a bit of a people watcher, so I enjoy that. And I get regular visits and phone calls. So folks, um, well, not so much visits, but um, I get little presents left at my door. So my food gets left at my door, um, uh, cleaning supplies, um, the odd cup of coffee that I, uh, special coffee that I order. So I feel really well uh, taken care of here in this um, Medi Hotel, as they're called. And I get called, I get, phone, get a phone call um, every day, or I, get, I think I get two phone calls a day. One is to check on my well-being, so a nurse calls me to, to see about my health and my psychological well-being. And I also get called by the police, the South Australian uh, police, to check that I haven't, as I heard one of the SAPO um, guys say at the airport, um, I haven't done a runner. <laughs> so um, I'll, I have no intentions of doing a runner, but I get checked up on every day to make sure that I'm here because they take it really seriously here in Australia. It's why the numbers of coronavirus cases is so low is because they've taken it so seriously. And I appreciate that. Like I'm happy to go by the, the rules in order to help protect myself and, and my fellow Australians. And I want to say I feel very fortunate. Not everybody, uh, actually not many people get to isolate in such ideal circumstances, I must say. And not everybody has the kind of personality. Oh, the sun just came out. That's going to really mess up my lighting. Maybe it'll go away. Um, not everybody has the kind of personality where uh, being in isolation is something that is pleasant or even feels particularly bearable. I'm an introvert by nature. I'm a hermit. I actually really like being alone. I have a, a strong mindfulness and self-compassion practice. And actually being alone for two weeks, it just feels like a really nice thing to be doing. I work from home as well, so that makes a big difference. So I have all these, all these things going in my favor. I just want to acknowledge that not everybody has all of those, all of those things. So this podcast is sort of to help address the less than ideal circumstances around isolation. And there's this great um, article, I'll put the, the link to the article um, in the little, little uh, cloud in the bottom left of this video. Um, it's put out by Very Well Mind and it's called, it's written by Arlen Kunzik and uh, it's called How to, How to Cope with Loneliness During the Coronavirus Pandemic. So that's mostly what I'll be referring to is this really good article that, um, that Arlen wrote. And I'll add to that the somatic self-compassion take on everything that um, Arlen has to, has to say. So the first thing that she says, and this is something that I love, is keeping to a schedule. Human beings, um, and actually most animals, um, enjoy having a schedule. We enjoy being able to predict what's going to happen next. 
We enjoy checking things off our lists, so completing tasks. Um, and we enjoy the sense of accomplishment by the end of the day. We like to know what we're going to be doing. Being left with um, sort of an open day with no schedule, um, not knowing what we're going to do, it can be nice, but it might be something that leaves us feeling like, um, I don't have an anchor for my day. I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do to occupy myself. And this can lead us to a bit of a, an, an existential crisis. If I don't have something in particular to do, I don't know how to define myself. If there are no activities and no direction, um, I'm missing that sort of grounding, that anchor of um, I'm a person who's doing these particular things. We're, we're often defined by our activity or our, our vocation. So if we don't have anything like that, it's hard to work out who we are which um, we don't need that sort of crisis when we're in isolation or when we're in quarantine. What we need is a lot of security and safety and a lot of feeling, feeling you know, as good as we can, basically. So a schedule, you can create your own schedule and it doesn't need to be one where you um, stick to it sort of dogmatically create a schedule that um, you want to you want to follow and even allow your body to inform your schedule so for me i know um, i like to wake up sort of around the same time every morning i'm jet lagged at the moment so my body wakes up at all sorts of strange times and wants to go to bed at all sorts of strange times but i'm trying to get myself into my new time zone so um, I, I try to stay up until like eight o'clock at night. I sometimes don't make that, but I, I, I aim for eight and then I aim to get up no earlier than five. So I'm trying to get myself into that bit of a schedule. I said my body wakes up at all times of the night and I wake up at 1.30 in the morning and thought, oh, time for breakfast. Nope, it's 1.30 in the morning. So part of my schedule is my eight to five sleep. Then I, or at least laying in, in bed if I'm not sleeping. And then, um, so I get up at five and my coffee and getting on my iPad and reading are sort of the three things that I really love to do in the morning. And so they make a really lovely coffee here at the hotel that I'm at. I'm at the, the Playford Hotel. And um, so I, I, can, I can buy a, a coffee from here and um, drink that first thing in the morning. I actually um, save a coffee from the previous day, so I have it early in the morning because the staff don't get here till um, about 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, so I have my coffee ready. I get on my iPad, I check my, my uh, emails, I check my Facebook, I uh, post something to Instagram. Yeah, I think they're the three main things that I do. Drink my coffee, get on my iPad, once I've finished on my iPad, I have a book that I read. So I'm really enjoying the book that I'm reading at the moment. Um, so then I read my book. And having that anchor for the day, so knowing when I wake up in the morning, I get to do something that I really enjoy. It's a, a good reason to get out of bed, basically. So wait until five o'clock, get up and do those, those lovely things that I enjoy. I've started my day off really nicely with that, that little ritual, coffee, iPad, book, ritual, um, started off with a schedule. And then um, meal times, they help to define schedule. So you know when meals are gonna happen if you're in sort of a quarantine, in a hotel quarantine situation. If you're at home on your own, you might set up specific times when you eat. So you know, okay, you know, it's three hours until the next meal. It gives you a sense of your own identity when you can place yourself on a timeline for the day. Once again, getting a sense of I'm a person who is going to be waiting for three hours and then I'm going to eat again. So we get to locate ourselves in, in time, basically. So the meal times here, um, meal, meals are delivered at particular times, so I can look forward to those in the day. 
the rubbish is collected at a particular time. So I've actually put that in my calendar along with the meal times. So that's something else that I plan for the day, put my rubbish out at a particular time. So I slot all of these into my schedule and then um, I have a sense of what's going to happen in between meal times. Things like I'm going to do some work on my computer. Usually I do that um, after I, when I feel like it basically, when I jolly well feel like it. So after I have um, had my coffee and my iPad and my, my book, um, then I'll, I'll do a bit of work on the computer. Because I'm jet lagged and I also have some adrenal fatigue, I have naps throughout the day. I usually have two naps throughout the day. So um, they happen when my body tells me they need it, usually around 11 and 2, roughly. I don't put them in my schedule because my body informs me about that. So there are a couple of other sort of landmarks in, in the day. Um, I call my husband at the same time every day. That's in my calendar as well. So I know, you know, I have that thing to look forward to and I schedule that outside of meal times. So all of this might sound really simplistic, but it can make a huge difference when you're alone and you're, you're wanting, as I said, that sort of confirmation that you exist. Having a schedule is confirmation that you exist and you exist in, in time. So having a schedule, that's the number one thing. And scheduling things that you're going to enjoy as well. If you have a favourite show, schedule when you're going to watch that. Favourite book, schedule when you're going to watch that. And the next thing that Arlen suggests is to stay informed um, about coronavirus, about the rules and the laws in the place that you're in. And this does not mean obsessively checking things like social media, which is not particularly reliable around things like coronavirus, unless it's an official um, uh, page for, you know, a government organisation or the World Health Organisation or somebody like that. So you can find credible sources of information online that tell you things like how long does the coronavirus um, last on particular surfaces? I did this myself. I am on uh, day two of um, my quarantine. And so I looked up how long can coronavirus last on fabric, on glass, on metal, on plastic and on vinyl, basically. And so what I know is, um, based on the information that I got, that it could last on clothing for two days. And I just want to just want to reiterate that's the information that I got that I got when I researched it. Please do your own research. Don't rely on on what I read. But just knowing that um, there's this two day window and I'll, I'll give it longer than two days just because I like to be careful. Um, it, what it means is it's another way to locate myself and my situation on a timeline. OK, so after two days, and I'll probably leave it longer, four or five days, after about five days, um, clothing is not likely to be um, uh, something that coronavirus has survived on. Um, so that gives me something to look forward to. And this looking forward to something, the neurochemical involved in that is dopamine. Dopamine is one of our happy neurochemicals. It's the reward neurochemical. So when I know um, that, I, that after five days, this, this is probably the day, the time that I'll give myself a clothing, after five days, my clothing is safe, I have something to look forward to. So I don't think I'll put that in my calendar, but I'll just be waiting until that five days. Having said that, I am super cautious about all of this. I have sanitized my hands, I don't know how many times, I sanitize I, everything I pull out of my suitcase. I sanitize. Thing is, you can't sanitize clothing unless you can wash it. So, and I don't have those facilities at the moment. Um, so, what I do is I take the what I read, the scientific information that I read, and then I basically double or triple those precautions. It, it's just what works for me, basically. So, yeah, be informed, um, but. 
there's no need to, and I, I know the human mind does this, there's no need to keep looking for information. There's, once you've found a credible source of information, um, you know, you might go to two or three sites, but there's no need to be obsessive about it. And as I said, certainly um, don't rely on, on people's opinions on social media to inform you. Um, they can, it's, it's a bit like a Alice in Wonderland situation. Um, it's, you don't know where you're gonna end. Um, and people, there are a lot of emotions involved with, with coronavirus and all of the politics around it and the social implications. So um, um, do you really wanna read everybody's opinion about these things, especially if you're in isolation and um, you're, already, you're already vulnerable. You're vulnerable because you might be feeling lonely. You might be feeling um, yeah, al alone and lonely. We might feel okay being alone, but feeling lonely. That What that is is cortisol in our system. That is telling us something's wrong here. And usually what's something, the, the thing that's wrong is I can't have my social contacts. I can't have my usual routine. Um, I'm not sure I exist if I don't have all of my usual things. So that's when, when cortisol levels rise. So yeah, stay informed. Stay active, um, keep moving, especially if you're someone who's accustomed to a lot of exercise. Um, be creative around your movement. Something like simply jumping up and down on the spot. It, it encourages endorphins into your system. So endorphins are another neurochemical that make us feel good. Endorphins are the neurochemical that specifically addresses cortisol. So if your cortisol is going up, if you're feeling stressed, movement and exercise can help to address that. So increased endorphins, decreased cortisol, basically. So movement, jumping up and down, not for a long time, just jump up and down. Um, for as long as you feel like it, you could laugh about it if it feels funny to jump up and down. Do your yoga or your stretching. Um, some of the folks here in the hotel have been really creative and are looking at hiring a treadmill um, for their room. So that's a great way to get some exercise. Um, watching a, a video of someone leading some sort of an exercise class, they offer that on the television here at the hotel. This, this is the great thing about the internet is we have access to all of these supports for physical activity when we're alone in our own home. So yeah, st staying active is really valuable. Stay connected with others, with your support people. Another one of the benefits of the internet is um, we can connect with folks um, on uh, social media, we can connect through Zoom or, or whatever um, video conferencing app that you use. Schedule those in. Um, be courageous and ask your family and your friends, hey, can we schedule a call every day at this time? Um, and let them know that this is part of your self-care routine while you're in isolation or while you're in quarantine. Lean on your support people. They will probably just love to support you when you're in, in uh, isolation. So, and put that in your calendar. You know, if you're gonna, as I said, I'm, I connect with my husband every day and I put that in my calendar. It's something to look forward to. The neurochemical that we feel when we feel connected and safe is um, oxytocin. So loneliness can often feel like it's, it's sort of the cortisol response to not getting enough oxytocin. So my oxytocin goes down, my cortisol might go up because I'm feeling lonely. I'm missing that social connection. So to bring your oxytocin up, connect with people you feel safe with, who you can trust, like-minded people, like-minded communities. If you're in a community of faith or you do a particular practice like mindfulness or self-compassion, um, connect with those folks. There are a lot of free groups online. Find one of those and especially one that meets every day, once again, to, to add to your schedule. So yes, yeah, stay, stay social. Lots of uh, somatic self-compassion, lots of 
physical gestures of care. And these don't need to be fancy. Things like a nice hot shower. I often have a hot shower in the afternoon um, just because it feels really nice. It's, it feels very um, nurturing. Uh, heat is something that, can, that helps us to feel uh, nurtured, warmth, basically. Warmth can increase our oxytocin levels. Um, taking a nap when you need it, that's a great self-care. Drinking plenty of water is a really important self-care activity. Eating food that's good for you, that's nourishing, it's another uh, self-care. If you can get fresh air or sunshine, um, doing that in your day. Sunshine's really important for our vitamin D levels, I believe. So getting, so if you can, well like this, like this sunshine, if you can get some sunshine in your day, then, then doing that. So yeah, taking care of yourself through all of these very simple, very practical self-care strategies. If you meditate, then um, setting a time to do that every day. Yoga or stretching is self-care. Your exercise is, is self-care. Uh, watching your favorite show is self-care. Eating chocolate is self-care or having a hot chocolate or a coffee. So this is a time where self-care is, is uh, it, you really need it when you're feeling isolated. So yeah, take care of yourself. Another thing you might do, this might be the last thing actually, is um, be creative. And creativity, like we're all artists, creativity might be something like journaling. Journaling is a great practice because it actually helps in all three of our well-being neurochemicals. We feel serotonin. Uh, so serotonin is the neurochemical that makes me feel special. We feel serotonin because when we're journaling about ourselves, we are the object of what we're writing about. So we get to feel special. By the way, mindfulness meditation also gives us all three of our happy neurochemicals, serotonin, oxytocin and dopamine. So journaling, serotonin, I'm the object of my writing. Uh, dopamine, I get the satisfaction of p finishing a page, uh, doing a creative task. And oxytocin, once again, it's around the connecting with myself, especially if we're doing it kindly with self-compassion. So get a little dose of oxytocin. So journaling, painting, writing, doodling, singing, um, um, doing sort of spontaneous movement, um, recording your voice as you speak your thoughts. That's an, it's, a, it's like a verbal journaling. Any other creative uh, thing that you do. Um, creativity, it, it, it can feel like a bit of a lost practice, creativity and, and artistic work, but so valuable, in, once again, in affirming that I exist. If I create, I exist. So that can, that can really support us. I think that's all I'll say. I'm over my 20 minutes. I would also say if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling anxious, um, as much as you feel alone, you are not alone and there is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing wrong with feeling lonely. If you have a mindfulness or a self-compassion practice and you feel you can hold these emotions, you might simply allow yourself to feel these emotions and to um, allow, allow a release and expression of these emotions. Allow yourself to have a little cry as long as that feels okay. If that feels like that's going to spiral you downwards, I'd say maybe that's not a practice, but if you feel like that will be a release, then you might just let yourself have a little cry because it is really hard to be alone. It is really hard to be isolated. We're social creatures. We need other people. We need other beings. Um, of course, there's a loss. There's a sense of grief when we don't have these things. So validate that for yourself. There is nothing wrong with you not liking that experience. There's no one else you should be. There's no one else you should be. Allow yourself to be who you are and offer some self-compassion to that person. 
Thanks so much for watching. Uh, take care. And I look forward to connecting again at the next Somatic Self-Compassion podcast. Mm -hmm.